Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Adam Lupel, IPI Vice President, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this policy forum, Organized Crime, Arms Trafficking, and Illicit Financial Flows, Exploring SDG Target 16.4, held on the sidelines of the 2019 High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development. I'd like to thank uh, our partners for this event, in particular the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, who initiated this process, uh, especially Summer Walker, who represents the initiative here in New York. Uh, I'll also take the opportunity to thank our other partners, um, as evidenced by the number of logos on the uh, placards there, this, um, this really is goal 17 in action. Thank you, Global Financial Integrity, Small Arms Survey, and the Permanent Mission of Mexico to the United Nations. This event is part of IPI's broader work on the SDGs, which in part focuses on how issues related to peace and prevention thread through all 17 goals, not only SDG 16, but it also harkens back uh, to our substantial past work on organized crime under the direction of James Cocaine, Walter Kemp, and Peter Gastro. Not many people perhaps realize this or remember this, but the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime actually got its start uh, in a series of meetings here at IPI in 2011 and 2012, um, some of them in this very room. And um, I've been here long enough that I remember some of those meetings with then IPI Director Programs, Peter Gastro, uh, who we remember uh, fondly at IPI, his time here, um, and also the future director of the GI, Mark Shaw. So we can perhaps consider this a bit of a homecoming for the GI, uh, Summer Tuesday. Welcome home. <laughs> in, in preparing for this event, I went back and looked at some of the original materials for those meetings, and I was struck by one statement by Peter Gastro in 2012, who said that one of the objectives of the Global Initiative would be to rethink approaches to organized crime, including through breaking down the silos between law enforcement, development, and political actors. And on the occasion of the HLPF, I think we are all aware of the progress we have made um, that the SDGs now provide an excellent platform uh, to do just that, in particular through Goal 16, uh, to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Goal 16 is, of course, a complex goal with many parts, but today we are going to focus in on Goal 16.4, whose adoption was a clear turning point in these debates in formally connecting considerations of organized crime, illicit financial flows, and arms trafficking with development policy. There is a lot to unpack here, and by the, uh, the crowd in the room, a lot of interest. Um, and we have a great panel to do all of that. Uh, first, we will have opening remarks from Isaac Morales Tenorio, who is in from Capital? He is Deputy Director General and Head of Multidimensional Security in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. Among other responsibilities, he is in charge of negotiations on transnational organized crime, arms trafficking, cybersecurity, the world drug problem, corruption, and emerging security challenges. Your, your file is quite full, uh, and we look forward to hearing from you. Isaac, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Adam, for this introduction. Um, distinguished panelists, uh, dear colleagues, uh, it's an honor to participate on behalf of the government of Mexico in this collective reflection. Um, we do believe that the high-level political fora provide us with a great opportunity to go into details. And as Adam said, to breaking silos. And regarding the efforts to accomplish the goal uh, 16, of course, 
this year we are called to deliver. In this framework, of course, uh, we celebrate this side event focusing on the target 16.4, which, by the way, obligate us, and let me say it again, obligate us to significantly reduce illicit financial and arms flows. Its adoption within the 2030 Agenda, it was a global recognition of the importance to counter transnational organized crime, to effectively promote and to reach peaceful and inclusive societies. For the government of Mexico, I can say that after years of success and failure, today it's a priority to promote social and development-oriented policies to effectively, to effectively prevent violence and crime. Now we say very clear that we do need not only law enforcement, but attending causes and consequences of the illicit markets <clears throat> at the national, at the regional, and at the international level. Illicit financial flaws and trafficking in firearms or small arms are two phenomena that clearly empower criminal organizations and enhance the capacity of illicit markets to produce violence and social disintegration. From this point of view, target 16.4 could be or should be a kind of cross-cutting target. In comparison to other uh, SDGs, uh, to other goals, the 16, it's perhaps more difficult to measure and it was, uh, as it was agreeing in respective targets and indicators. The SDG 16 is more oriented to quality than quantity. Then, even when it's challenging, we have to take the opportunity to review in a comprehensive manner good and also bad experiences regarding its implementation. And trying to, to enrich our analysis and being this uh, opening remarks, uh, taking the opportunity of this opening remarks, uh, if you allow me, I will share with you three general ideas that I believe will contribute to improve the way forward. First, implementation. It's not redundant, but necessary to say that we have already agreed that the 16.4 target is part of the 2030 agenda. This is to say that it has practically the same importance to address illicit financial flows and arms flows that climate change or other, or other global challenges. The way to implement this target is not reduce to the concrete indicators, all kind of legal, operational, and preventive efforts should be considered and evaluated. In this regard, for instance, it's not only needed to address arms flaws, but both, but uh, ammunition, for instance. And it's not only about money laundering, but the need to address all new kind of forms of illicit financial flows. Second idea, around trip analysis. To better review, reviewing efforts regarding the 16.4, we need both going from the local to the global experiences and bringing international advances to the regional, national, and local levels. We, of course, we all have concrete experiences at the local and national levels to share and maybe to promote its replication. But we also, at the international level and regional levels, we also have a strengthened international regimes regarding uh, these two issues or improving their implementation. What I want to say is that it's necessary then to build upon those instruments and regimes 
and to try to build synergies and to call all member states to adopt those international or regional efforts in order to also contribute to target 16.4. Let me share with you, very brief, that the government of Mexico have convened two informal meetings uh, this year, year uh, in, in May this year and, and April last year, um, two informal meetings of secretariats and governing bodies of international instruments of uh, small arms and firearms trafficking. The idea is, as I said, to build synergies from their respective mandates. We are not um, promoting going beyond the mandates or duplicating the different instruments, but integrating all those efforts. The third idea, the multi-stakeholder approach. These days, it's very usual to incorporate this concept into discourses. But now we need to make it happen. Governments, academia, civil society, and private sector contribute in different manners and different stages to prevent or to reduce illicit financial and arms flows. And this panel, from our point of view, it's a clear uh, expression of this, um, of this uh, common commitments. Uh, all the, the, as, as, a, as a final word, I would like to, to share with you a couple of findings resulting from these um, events that I said we have convened in la this year and early this year and last year. First finding is there is a link between illicit arms trafficking security and obstacles or challenges to development. In relation to this, target 16.4 is paramount for the future work of organizations, instruments, and mechanisms addressing small arms and light weapons. There is a link between weapons and ammunition as catalysts of violence and homicides rates. There is an agreement on the importance of recognition ongoing trends which are currently taking place in the connection between traffic in all its forms and other criminal phenomena, particularly, it's important to say, corruption, which is, by the way, the, the, the um, target 16.5. Also, it is key to deal with final users Growing importance has to be accorded to the ultimate use and the ultimate destiny of these weapons. All these kind of links uh, now recognized by different uh, stakeholders is important to take into account in, in order to decide how to strengthen our efforts at the national, regional, and international levels. And we are sure that this side event and the whole um, high-level uh, political forum discussion will encourage to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much, Isaac, for sharing your uh, the priorities of your government, and I'm in particular struck by these three general ideas. Implementation should not be reduced to just specific targets, but the goals need to be considered comprehensively. I like this idea of the round trip analysis. We talk a lot about uh, relationships between the lo global and the local here to think about it as a as a feedback system going from local to global, global, regional, national, and, and keep the keep the cycle going. Um, and then of course the multi-stakeholder approach which is very important for, for IPI as, a, as we see ourselves as a bridge between member states, civil society, the private sector, uh, academia and such. So this is all uh, extremely important in approaching this uh, topic. We've got a great uh, uh, panel ahead of us. Uh, I won't spend much time on introductions. We've got, you've got full bios in, in the programs. Um, but let me just go through quickly uh, the, uh, the order that we have. We'll be starting from, from right. We are, we're sitting in order, great. Uh, we're going from right to left. So first we'll have Ana Alfazzi del Fratze, Director of Program Small Arms Survey. Then uh, Mr. Tom Cardamone, President of Global Financial Integrity. 
uh, Martin Bourgeau, Chief Technical Advisor for Justice, Security, and Human Rights at UNDP Lebanon. And then Tuesday, Raitano, Deputy Director, Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Uh, and uh, with that, those brief words, I'll turn it over to you. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I, uh, I will have to look at, uh, yes, <laughs> Amanda is suggesting to speak closer. Uh, so, um, first of all, 16.4, very, very complex uh, language and um, complexity is, uh, is something that needs to be unpacked. So um, it's not a surprise that uh, when you go to implementation, uh, you still uh, see the silos approach because uh, this is what uh, organizations are used to, and this is what uh, really the sustainable development goals uh, should try to, to, uh, to change. So trying to explain what uh, an incredible opportunity uh, it is to address uh, different agendas, different issues under the same framework uh, towards promoting sustainable development. So the, the, the first uh, thing that we see is that uh, uh, we have discussions uh, uh, like uh, in Rome uh, at the meeting in preparation for the HLPF on Goal 16, where uh, talking about 16.4 was uh, something that uh, uh, wanted to address the, the separate uh, elements of target 16.4 uh, one by one, and where there was the lack of uh, connection that you are trying to promote here through this panel. So uh, things were seen in isolation. And uh, it resulted in uh, some very, very strong comments from the floor, from people who are affected by the misuse of arms. And they said, well, if you don't connect these things, then you are really miss missing the, the, the topic. So uh, the, the important thing that we saw uh, coming from the arms control community was that uh, the change of language uh, represented an opportunity. Illicit arms flows is not illicit trafficking in arms. So paradoxically, uh, it provided the opportunity to disconnect from the uh, transnational organized crime approach even though it is in the same, uh, in the same target, uh, uh, even though you have a reference to organized crime in target 16.4, uh, indeed, uh, talking about illicit flows gave the possibility to highlight that you have to look at the entire spectrum, so not only at cross-border trafficking, but also internal domestic issues. So the diversion from licit to illicit should be prevented everywhere. There should be the prevention of illicit production, and there should be the prevention of misuse. So how you measure a reduction of illicit arms flow, so you cannot really go and count by one, one by one the guns, but you really have to measure a reduction in the negative impacts, so a reduction of the armed violence. Just a parenthesis, uh, uh, for, for many years uh, there was a diplomatic initiative, the Geneva Declaration on Armed Violence and Development, uh, that was really trying to do this, trying to, to promote an approach that, uh, that would uh, connect the, the, uh, uh, the reduction of armed violence to advancing on development. And it was a precursor of target 16.4. So this is one of the things. The second, uh, the second point is the, uh, the need to uh, elaborate on the uh, Agenda 2030 uh, to highlight the importance of uh, looking at aspects like gender, for example, uh, for in sectors like this one of arms control uh, that is uh, uh, traditionally uh, supported by, by strong masculine uh, uh, perspectives. So uh, working on gender in this area uh, represents an opportunity to bring around the table uh, uh, some of the people who may have uh, uh, not had an opportunity to contribute uh, to the discussion, some of the people who may be affected, and uh, to, to give some uh, uh, important uh, uh, meaning to uh, the discussion that is happening around, for example, the arms trade treaty, where you have a, a very clear formulation about preventing gender-based violence in, in arms exports. And 
connecting the different agendas uh, here is, is, is something that comes quite natural and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the target 16.4 represents an umbrella for, for all this. Uh, the, um, the other point that, that we uh, use in our uh, discussions on 16.4 is that to, to, to achieve this target, basically states should just effectively implement uh, arms control commitments that they have entered to. Uh, it is, it is uh, something that may sound very, very simple, but in reality, uh, many countries uh, are still uh, struggling to, to really uh, effectively implement uh, some of the commitments under the, the various arms control instruments they have. Uh, in particular, uh, what we see by reading the reports, uh, uh, for example, on the program of action on small arms and light weapons, uh, we see that there is still a need to uh, understand the connection with, uh, with, with development, the connection with, uh, uh, for example, women, peace and security agendas. And in this area, um, the, uh, the silos approach is still very, very difficult to, to, to break. Uh, so um, one of the uh, important uh, things that we hear from, from the feedback that we get from states is that, well, we try, but it's difficult to knock on the doors of development uh, institutions. So there is still a lack of dialogue between different institutions dealing with different uh, uh, parts. Uh, so in practice, the, the implications uh, are very operational. Uh, we see that uh, the uh, uh, the day-by-day -day work of certain uh, agencies that are dedicated to, uh, to arms control uh, may have not really been uh, uh, informed sufficiently by, by this change of language. And there is, a, there is still quite a lot of work to do to make sure that uh, arms control remains in the agenda, and that it remains high, really, in the, uh, in the agenda and uh, supported, possibly, by the development uh, community uh, who should really understand how important this is uh, for development. Thank you. Great. Uh Thanks, Anna. I think I began by saying that, uh, pointing out the progress, but it's interesting how you say that even though um, you know, the, the rationale of the SDGs is to break through these silos, that you still see so much of a siloed uh, approach, there's still a lack of connection amongst different parts of the system, lack of even dialogue, um, and something uh, that needs to be uh, systematically addressed and to keep our, keep our eye on that. Um, <coughs> with that, I will turn to Tom. Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about illicit financial flows and its um, uh, connection to the SDGs and the importance of curtailing illicit flows in the effort to promote sustainable, de sustainable development. I think before I get into my comments about the current state of play, I, I'd like to remind people of a little bit of history. Uh, which is that the term illicit financial flows didn't exist until late 2006. Uh, and so that in the context of putting an, uh, an issue on the global agenda, the fact that it's actually in the SDGs that were adopted in 2015, that's a light speed sort of accomplishment by the international community to get this issue uh, not only promoted, but understood and embraced by the international community. Uh, and as Mr. Tenorio said in his opening remarks, governments are obligated now, because it's in the SDGs, to address this particular issue. So a bit of history, I think, always helps uh, put this issue in context. A little bit more context is that addressing illicit flows is critically important not only in and of itself, the fact that it's a target that has to be addressed, but the fact that if it is addressed by governments, uh, it will enable them to achieve the other targets, the other goals, because of the money it generates. There's a huge amount of money that is siphoned out of developing country economies each year because of illicit flows. Uh, 
I think it's also important to understand illicit flows is not a, a single thing. Uh, it's many different types of flows of illicit money, whether it's due to grand corruption, transnational crime, which we'll hear about more in a moment, profit shifting by multinational corporations, uh, and trade misinvoicing, which is an issue that uh, global financial integrity spends a lot of time uh, addressing. So because of the huge amount of money flowing out, it's a critically important thing. Uh, also critically important is the fact that the global consensus is now that the money to be raised to uh, fulfill, achieve the SDGs, which is estimated at about $1.4 trillion per year, has to be generated by the developing countries themselves. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of pressure on developing countries to find new sources of revenue. Uh, it's likely that official development assistance is not going to increase substantially. It's sort of plateaued at about $150 billion a year. Uh, it's not likely to go higher than that. Uh, so how do, you, how do you get from where they are now to $1.4 trillion a year? Well, you have to claw back uh, the amount of money that's being lost due to illicit flows. And I will, will also say that while curtailing illicit financial flows uh, in and of itself will not help governments achieve the SDGs, I will say that if they fail to curtail their illicit flows problem, they will likely fail at achieving the SDGs because of the massive amounts of money that's involved. So that's a bit of context, a bit of background. Uh, I'd like to talk about where we are now. It's a, it's, a, it's a good news, bad news type of situation. I'll start with the bad news and end on hopefully an up note. Uh, what do we know about illicit flows? We know that they're massive, about a trillion dollars a year uh, as we've estimated them over the last several years. Uh, we think that estimate is conservative, meaning we think it's a lot higher than that. Uh, the problem is chronic. Uh, there's nothing in the data that we have seen over the last 10 years or, or so that gives us any indication that uh, illicit financial flows are being substantially curtailed. Uh, the problem is ubiquitous. There is no developing country or emerging market country that does not have a problem with illicit financial flows. So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's something that should be of paramount importance to governments going forward. And one last point on the bad news side is that four years into the SDG period, we're not seeing many countries uh, really attacking this problem as we think they should. There are many tools, mechanisms, policies, rules, regulations, laws that could be used to begin to really get on top of this. We're not seeing too many countries doing that. So they're a bit behind schedule uh, as far as we look at it. Now some good news. Uh, many things have been done uh, in the global context to help uh, governments create uh, or, or obtain more information related to illicit financial flows. Uh, the so-called ABC rules, uh, automatic exchange of financial information between governments. This allows a uh, tax department in a developing country to see the amount of money held by one of their nationals in a foreign bank account. Um, um, beneficial ownership information. This is the whole notion of requiring uh, companies to provide the name and contact information of the individuals who actually control the company. This is critically important because what this does is it creates transparency in corporate ownership. Uh, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the Panama Papers. The basic point in that scandal is that anonymous shell companies are used around the world to hide, move, and launder money. Uh, if you create transparency in corporate ownership, you get at that particular problem. Country-by-country uh, -country reporting. Uh, this is newly established, uh, newly implemented, uh, the requirement where multinational corporations have to report some very basic financial information 
um, income, taxes paid, number of employees for every jurisdiction where they operate. Now, unfortunately, uh, when this was being negotiated at the OECD, we had hoped, advocates had hoped, that this would be completely transparent. Unfortunately, the only requirement is that they have to report it to their home tax authority. Uh, that's a good start. Uh, I think there needs to be some building on top of that to make it more transparent. Uh, I think the understanding that profit shifting by not multinational corporations uh, uh, siphons about $200 billion a year out of developing country economies is an important thing. The, um, the IMF issued a report in March uh, uh, stating that. Uh, Christine Lagarde had, a, had an opinion piece in the Financial Times talking about this. So this is something that the IMF is really getting behind, really beginning to focus on. Uh, it is a main source of illicit flows and really needs to be attacked. And the fact that the IMF is sort of sticking their flag in the ground on this is critically important. And one last point I'll finish with is that, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, what global financial integrity is doing in this space, is the ability for developing country customs departments to address trade misinvoicing. Now, our data shows that the amount of revenue lost through trade misinvoicing, the mispricing of invo invoices as a way to avoid VAT taxes and customs duties is, is similar along the same order of magnitude as that loss due to profit shifting by multinationals. So again, critically important thing to address. Uh, we have developed a software product developing country governments can use to identify when misinvoicing occurs in real time, meaning they can hold up a transaction, they can hold up goods in the port until they collect the proper amount of duties uh, and taxes. It's a way, it's a tool they can use to begin to claw back some of this money that they're losing. And we are seeing an uptake in the use of this tool, uh, a lot of interest in this tool. So uh, all, these, uh, all these areas are, I think, uh, reason for optimism going forward uh, with the understanding that, again, we're four years into this process. Our view is that governments really have to begin to step up uh, their efforts to address this critically important problem. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, you, you, started, you started with this point, uh, this uh, that illicit financial flows as a term did not exist until 2006, which is really uh, quite fascinating. And I think it kind of goes back to what Anna said about, uh, about the distinction between illicit arms trafficking and illicit arms flows, and that the, the, the concept of flows lends itself to a more comprehensive approach, which I think is, is, uh, is, is really insightful. Um, and the, but the bad news is that these flows are massive. I mean, the, the numbers that you're talking about is really extraordinary. And as you say, chronic, ubiquitous, and unfortunately, member states are behind uh, schedule. Um, and I don't know the good news that there's better information and understanding, but of course, you know, action has to follow understanding. Uh, so great, uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and now we'll turn to uh, UNDP and Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Adam, and thank you, IPI, for inviting UNDP to that uh, important debate. Um, closer. So um, from UNDP side, uh, I will talk more about the, actually the small arms uh, dimension of the 16.4, because this is an area where UNDP has worked extensively in the past um, two decades. And I wanted to reflect a bit on how the Agenda 2030 is an opportunity to address differently small arms and arm violence uh, issues and obviously help delivering on, on the target 16.4. Uh, because today uh, we know that the, the global supply of small arms has increased uh, over the past decade, uh, mainly due to civilian holdings. and. Uh, the target 16.4 is definitely an important element of the overall uh, development agenda. Um, so the Agenda 2030 uh, is a good framework uh, for UNDP to work on a more comprehensive approaches to small arms, because what we noticed is a lot of uh, actions uh, to respond to arm violence at national level have been too narrow 
uh, and isolated in their approaches. I think uh, the previous panelists uh, insisted on the importance to break silos. Um, and I think that is what the 2030 agenda actually offers. Um, and there is a need uh, to, to address that multifaceted nature of uh, small arms and uh, issues. Um, specifically, we at UNDP, we noticed the need to work on what we call both the demand and the supply side. So arm ammunition and control, uh, but also arm violence uh, reduction. Because we have seen from the, the work of low and middle income countries that the best chances of success come from comprehensive uh, public safety and community security uh, program that connect actually the local uh, to the national as uh, Mr. Morales was uh, actually uh, emphasizing earlier. So in the area of small arms and ammunition control, uh, for example, the target 16.6 .6 on accountable institution uh, is, an is an opportunity to promote uh, public debate as well as legislation, regulation, and small arms, because we have seen uh, some good progress, actually, on legislation and, and regulation. But we see from UNDP uh, the need, actually, to have more debates uh, at national and local level on uh, issues of small arms and to involve communities in shaping uh, national policies on that topic. The target 16.A on strengthening national institutions uh, to prevent uh, violence but also the SDG 11 and making cities safe um, uh, is an opportunity to support national uh, institution and regulation and control of small arm uh, and light weapon, as well as ammunition, such as the National Commission on Small Arms, uh, but also improve management uh, of ammunition stockpiles. The SDG 16, uh, that is more on the uh, global partnerships and South-South cooperation is a good opportunity to support more cross-border cooperation because we know that uh, prerequisites to prevent, combat, and eradicate illicit trade in small arms is ensuring that law enforcement agencies coordinate and cooperate uh, with one another. And such cooperation is also critical for arm violence prevention. On the demand side, which is more how to reduce uh, arm violence, uh, what we see at UNDP is that we need more of bottom-up and locally-led uh, approaches. Uh, and uh, we see also the need to have more uh, approaches focused on prevention, uh, notably to address risk factors, but also at-risk groups. So the indicator uh, 1662 on, on population satisfied with uh, public services is a good opportunity to promote uh, uh, democratic policing, so, uh, but also to support local armed violence reduction strategies, plans, and measures. The target 16.1, that is more on protection of civilians, but also the goal for on education offers also opportunities to support social actors and communities to improve resilience to violence and crime through indirect armed violence prevention approaches. And the goal four is a good also uh, entry point to provide incentives for youth at risk of violence to complete, for example, schooling, promote culture of peace uh, and nonviolence. The 2030 agenda is also a good opportunity to address the gender dimension of armed violence. Uh, Anna earlier uh, emphasized actually that uh, the armed violence is heavily gender. Um, and uh, the 2030 agenda uh, offers the opportunity to support approaches that are more transformative. So not only identifying how women and men are affected uh, differently by armed violence, but also addressing underlying causes such as gender role and social norms. <clears throat> um, the SDG is also a good framework to start collecting data and nurture a debate, informed debate on small arms uh, issues. Uh, we have seen a number of countries uh, starting collecting systematically data on small arms and arm violence uh, the past 15 years with interesting results, notably 
uh, in Central uh, and South America and the Caribbean, uh, including through the establishment of national uh, uh, crime observatories, but also in the region of the Western Balkans. Um, and UNDP is very much supporting actually uh, those efforts. That said, the majority of countries still um, do not have usable data on uh, those uh, issues, uh, and uh, notably insufficient also data, not, uh, not only on homicide, but also on perceptions, uh, and also on the gender dimension of armed violence uh, that I mentioned earlier. So this absence of data is an obstacle to develop uh, efficient strategies, but also to uh, to uh, um, encourage uh, debates uh, and involving communities uh, in uh, national strategies on small arms and armed violence. Um, the last point I wanted to make is that we often see the 2030 agenda as a uh, nationally led agenda, uh, but at UNDP in the area of uh, armed violence reduction and small arms, we see the need really to involve local governments and local communities. Uh, what we have seen is that uh, if the, the, the strategies on armed violence are not uh, locally led, um, those strategies most of the time they, they are doomed to failure. And the same for the work of national institutions on small arms. National Commission on Small Arms that are successful are those that work actually very closely with local uh, governments and, and communities. So this is just to say that the 2030 agenda uh, is not only for national institutions, but actually we should also use that agenda to work, involve more local uh, communities. Um, then uh, last uh, remark is just to say that with uh, UNDP and the uh, Office for Disarmament Affairs of the United Nations, are actually uh, working on a joint program that is uh, encompassing all these different uh, approaches that I mentioned today and that we hope to, to launch actually in a, in a few months. So that's the efforts from our side. Thank you. Great, Martin. I think you know one of our goals for this event, I think, was to make make connections amongst all these different uh, agendas, and I think you do that you do that very well, uh, showing how the 2030 agenda helps to move past two narrow approaches, not just across all uh, 17 goals, but also within goal 16. You mentioned 16.1, reducing violence, 16.6, 16a, uh, and you mentioned a number of other uh, goals and. Um, the need for law enforcement agencies to cooperate with other uh, elements of the government, it makes me think back on, on Isaac's point um, that we need more than just uh, strict law enforcement. We need to, to investigate the causes and the consequences uh, of, of these issues related uh, to help us to improve on prevention. And uh, you mentioned the youth component and the gender component, which I think is uh, extremely important. Uh, and then, of course, the SDGs provides us with a a uh, helpful tool to, to instigate data collection, but that's also a profound challenge because uh, so many member states uh, are behind. Uh, thank you for, for all of that. Uh, Tuesday, you're going to wrap it all up, make it all connections, and uh, take us forward. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, indeed, back where our little seed of the Global Initiative germinated, I think it is to pick up on your reference back into our old days, uh, it's worth saying that the Global Initiative, which began as a conversation amongst about 25 to 30 people in this room, is now a network of nearly 400 actors who every day work together in the fight against transnational organized crime. And I think the fact that we've gone from 2013 and 30 to 2019 and 400 is a testament to how critically important a discussion around the challenges of organized crime have become and how global, how diverse and how multi-stakeholder that conversation needs to be. And I think I would very much echo my colleagues on the panel in saying that all we are speaking to here in this event is the need to think more about organized crime and think about it in a wider range of people. So it, is, it was and is for us an enormous achievement to see organized crime as part of the SDG agenda. For us, we see it as a recognition, first of all, that organized crime is a cross-cutting threat to, organize, uh, to development, sustainable development and the core mandates of development actors. 
but it is, as my panelists have said before me, a call to arms to development actors to come to the table and recognize that they have a responsibility here, not only to say we see organized crime as a development threat, but to bring development tools to the table. And it's similarly a call to arms to the member states who have signed up to the SDG agenda to take the issue seriously. I feel while I would like to concentrate predominantly on 16.4 in my remarks today, I think it's also worth remembering that 16.4 target isn't the only place where organized crime features. A number of my colleagues have mentioned other ones that you see it in targets around preventing exploitative labor and human trafficking, that you see it around gender and uh, protection of women and girls, that you see it in health goals around addressing counterfeit medicines and addressing uh, the challenges of HIV AIDS and injecting drug user communities, that you see it in the goals on the environment and preventing illicit fishing, preventing poaching, preventing um, illicit and toxic waste capture by criminal groups and the, that being handled badly. It really is a cross-cutting issue to the SDGs. And we once did a count of all of the targets and of the 169 targets, we saw some 23% of them required directly responding to illicit economies or criminal actors if they were going to be successful. So again, I mean, to call to arms not only to the people prescient enough to come to a conversation on 16.4, but a call to arms to a wide range of development communities who need to respond. What we, so what we see in 16.4, though, is a really interesting bringing together of a criminal and description of a criminal in ecosystem, that you see a conversation around illicit financial flows, you see a conversation around arms trafficking, and that our organized crime is tacked onto the end. Actually, from our perspective as analysts of organized crime and criminal economies around the world, these th two things are intimately connected into an, inter into an ecosystem which might have two stratas. At the one hand, the top of the food chain, the glamorous and the elites and the wealthy of the international financial system who have learned to secrete their wealth in more interesting, diverse, and successful ways. Um, to add to the jaw-dropping statistics that Tom already gave us estimating the scale of this diversion, I wanted to add some also. Um, some 60% of wealth in the Gulf states is now held offshore. 50% of wealth, Russian wealth, generated in the Soviet Union is held offshore. 30% of African wealth is now held offshore. That overall, it is estimated that somewhere between, whether you take a conservative or a provocative estimate, 8% and 30% of global GDP is held in secrecy jurisdictions and places where its ownership and its profits cannot be followed, traced, or understood. That's an extraordinary amount of money. And it is money that's simply been leached out of the system, which has then had an extraordinary impact, I think, on the kinds of economies that often my colleagues in small arms survey describe, so the bottom of the system. So while we have a growing economy for the 1%, to steal my uh, Oxfam's terminology, the bottom 50% of the globe is feeling the consequence of these in levels of violence that are just unparalleled and unprecedented now. And violence in a multiple of ways, and I think, you know, UNDP speaks to them extremely well, that you see, on the one hand, urban violence, often driven by competing criminal groups seeking territory and to control uh, illicit flows and trafficking points, and broadly to fight for their own space in a political agenda. We published last year, joint with Interpol and a Norwegian think tank called RIPTO, a world atlas of illicit flows, which mapped the resources that are generated in conflict zones around the world. So looking only at war economies and illicit rents that are generated within zones of active conflict, and estimated there in the region of 24 to $39 billion is generated annually. A lot of this money, of course, both comes in and goes out on the sale of arms and weapons. Uh, I think both of Anna spoke to that extremely well, which the problem, I think the legacy is very long, that, you know, that arms stay, they're not easily destroyed, they circulate, they circulate out of the hands of legitimate conflict actors, they circulate out of the hands of state institutions and policing into the hands of criminal groups and gangs, into violent conflict actors, terrorist groups, and those with other agendas. And they stay for a very long time. We um, picked up some data from a study that looked at GPS data around uh, Ecuadorian mining sites. 
And you see in the protection of Ecuadorian mining sites, actors who have high level and sophisticated weapons, missiles, um, long range weaponry, grenades that they're using there to control an illicit economy. So over and all, the interconnection between conflict zones, the arms trade, violence, and its perpetuation is a source of extended and protracted wealth and instability. But I think that the finding from the illicit atlas exercise that we did that is probably the most startling and pertinent was not the amount of money that was raised, because I think that was intuitive, but actually how little of it stayed at the site of the conflict and flowed to conflict actors. So when we calculated and looked at the estimated level of resources that average conflict actors or specific conflict actors would need to perpetuate their activities, our calculation was probably that was only 4%, 4 to 5% of the total amount of money being generated. So the question, of course, then is where was that money going? Where was the money that was being generated in conflict earned at the gunpoint flowing to? And we can't answer that question because we don't know, because it's held in secrecy jurisdictions and it flows outside of or parallel to the financial system in a way that we can't track. I think one potential answer is to the question of where is that money going is actually to look at the democratic process. So it is very notable now that the overall democ democratic system and individual elections are costing extraordinary sums of money, more than you can possibly <coughs> sort of think that would be justified in the cost of trying to win political power. The last US election was estimated to have cost around $7 billion. The Indian election that happened just two months ago, another $7 billion. The Kenyan election, was the which was the most expensive election in African history, was 500 million or half a billion dollars. Extraordinary sums of money that candidates have to earn from themselves that they have to fundraise from private corporations, from lobbyists, from private individuals, again, without us being able to know where that money has come from. And while it's not to say that the money in the, LS, uh, in the international financial system and held in secrecy jurisdictions mm -hmm. is only criminal money earned from drug trafficking or organized crime, but the point is that now it is that kind of architecture that was created to protect and preserve the wealth of the elite is as much a vehicle for organized crimes profit as it is for any other form, and we can't distinguish one from the other. So we fundamentally don't know and can't answer who it is that funds our electoral processes. We can't answer some of the most pressing questions of I think most of the Westphalian democracies now, which is how do we address the impact that this has on the levels of confidence that people have in their electoral systems? How do we address issues of disinformation when we don't know who has paid for what in what campaign? How do we then answer to those people who see their ability to live their lives every day, to access the basic public utilities, the um, benefits of being part of a system of governance, no longer directed in their direction because the wealth and the money is going elsewhere and that the attention of political powers whose, I guess, agreements were baked into the electoral process with the people who paid for their right to stand is no longer orientated necessarily at the development benefit of its broader population. So I think all of these, I mean, they're critical questions that we face now around the uh, debate of where is development going, where is governance going? And that's why it's so important to goal 16 as a whole. I think what some of you may be asking is, well, she's very exciting and she's very passionate about this, but is she talking about organized crime? And I think that's almost how I would like to end my remarks, which is, maybe this isn't what we think about as organized crime. Maybe when, you, when we say organized crime to everybody now, they think about Goodfellas or The Godfather, or maybe thanks to Netflix, they'll think about Narcos or El Chapo. They certainly won't be thinking about the Guptas in South Africa who conspired with the head of state to steal some $7 billion from the South African treasury via procurement contracts and fraud whilst at the same time you're seeing within that same country levels of poverty, racial disparity, and inclusion, but extraordinarily levels of violence. In the drug trafficking controlled slums of Cape Town, an, there's an average of 40 homicides a week. That's extraordinary levels of violence in one of our glitzy tourism capitals of the world. So I think one of the questions is, in, you know, is this organized crime? Well, if not, shouldn't it be? 
And I'm sitting here in New York, so we'll stick a little an American example on the end, but I was very struck by the fact that I don't think we use the term organized crime well and correctly, particularly when I saw the judgment of the Manafort trial. And where a man who has practiced systematically money laundering, <coughs> tax evasion, and fraud was sentenced by a judge who argued for leniency because he was a generous man who was a good friend and had otherwise lived a blameless life. I'm like, seriously? So, you know, is that, is that not as deserving as a term of organized crime when it influences foreign uh, domestic elections and curries favor for foreign governments? And again, the source of wealth cannot be known as the criminal groups and gangs that you often see on the front pages of the headlines under the same moniker. So over and all, to wrap up my <laughs> three-minute diatribe, I think what is very notable around this conversation of what should be described as organized crime, coming back to the question of goal 16.4, is that we didn't even try. And that when we have talked about indicators and targets and data, the targets and the data sets and the indicators that were put for the measurement of goal 16.4 were a measurement of illicit financial flows and a measurement of arms tracking thinking, but there is nothing on organized crime. So if we haven't put a metric or a definition, do we even know what we're talking about? And is there really that call to arms to member states then to respond to whether or not they're addressing the problem? So for conclusion for us, I think we echo and re-echo the calls from all the panelists, which is, we need to talk about it, and we need to think about it, and we need to really think about what we mean when we talk about it. We need to learn to understand how to measure it. And my organization will be launching here in September a organized crime index, where we will be looking at states-based metrics around the set scope and scale of illicit markets. We'll be looking at illicit actors within that economy, which includes those that are embedded in the state. And we will also be looking at measures of states' resilience to organized crime. And whether or not that is catalytic then in starting a conversation about what is organized crime, how does it manifest, and how is it interrelated, how do, what is the role of violent actors, what is the role of illicit financial flows in these questions, I hope it will begin that conversation because it really needs to be said. And then finally, I mean, this panel, when we were thinking about it and conceiving it, I think the think tank community, of which most of my colleagues, apart from UNDP, but he's a good example too, um, we are thinking about it, and we are trying to join up, and we are trying to connect, and that we need the scope to do so. Because when you're talking in a framework of almost quasi-state capture in some cases, the voices of civil society are important that they, I mean, speak truth to power is a little bit cheesy, but they are being ex targeted across the board in a way that, again, I'm sorry to use the word, but unprecedented. If you look at the violence and the assassination attempts and the threats made to journalists and to environmental defenders and to human rights activists, civil society is under threat because we're saying what other people aren't. And I really am thrilled and incredibly proud to be on the panel with all of my colleagues here because they do say it. And I think we need the space to do so. The United Nations um, Transnational Organized Crime Convention, uh, UNTOC, which was in the last cycle, which was uh, last October, agreed to a review mechanism on the implementation of UNTOC's provisions, which included at the behest of a certain number of member states who delayed its approval for nearly a decade on the grounds that civil society needed to have a role to play in that conversation. So other member states sought to block that, which I think is telling. So I think overall we need to see an empowerment of the kind of actors who can speak about organized crime in all of its forms and manifestations from good fellas to the guptas, <laughs> and that we can look at it critically, that we can gather, create, and share data as all of my colleagues on the panel do, and that we can make the connections between not only arms trafficking, illicit flows, and organized crime, but all of the connections spoken to the other parts of Goal 16, to the other parts of the SDG agenda. Thank you. Well, Tuesday, there is a tremendous amount there. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, I wouldn't even try to uh, summarize, but, but I mean, one thing that is clear to me listening to you is you know, transnational organized crime, organized crime is a cross-cutting threat to development. 
Um, you, you mentioned 23% of the targets require addressing organized crime. But what I think you, you bring up very importantly is that it's also, this results in violence. Um, and violence, and it's also not just a threat to, uh, so there's people's lives at stake, and this is not just a threat to development, but it's also a threat to uh, democracy, good governance, um, which brings us all back full circle to the goal of promoting accountable and inclusive institutions. And one theme that I hear in your remarks is that much of this rests upon this, this, this web of secrecy um, uh, around the world. And so we really need to be, uh, do a considerable amount of work um, about being clearer uh, on what are we talking about when we talk about organized crime um, in order to address it. Tom mentioned that there is progress on information um, and understanding, but there's, there's clearly much more work to be done. Um, we still got a lot of people in the room here that I'm sure want to ask questions. We've got a good uh, uh, half an hour or so for a Q&A, and so um, I will open the floor. We can take uh, several questions at once. Please uh, introduce yourself for the webcast, um, and I see one uh, in standing in the back right, right now. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Abigail Ruane, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and also the Women's Major Group. This has been such a rich and interesting discussion. 16.4 in the SDGs may be linked to organized crime, but it's also part of a broader picture of gender-based and other forms of violence. And action on peace and sustainable development has to work for women and girls in conflict situations, which requires accelerated action on the arms trade treaty, including the gender criterion, and the program of action of small arms, and gender equality and women peace and security agendas more generally. Reducing arms and illicit flows really brings us back to the transformative intent, intent of, the women, of the sustainable development agenda. Because right now what we're seeing with the SDGs is even though it has a huge transformative impact and there's lots of reasons for us to be doing coordination and policy coherence, action remains very ad hoc. And peace and development is still being treated as a development project, but clearly it's not. We need to be looking at extraterritorial accountability, spillover effects, policy co uh, coordination and coherence. And so while we've had a really good discussion so far on the importance of linking these agendas, I'm really interested in hearing from the panelists about how to do so. Some of the opportunities that we've seen um, for women peace builders and women human rights defenders have been around looking at having gender, peace, and environmental impact assessments across ministries and issue areas in order to assess, for example, rising security budgets and undermining of human rights and gender equality budgets, um, including women peace and security and small arms focal points in SDG, SDG coordination mechanisms uh, to, and ensuring women's civil society in the process, and for example, at the SDG Summit in September, where there's looking for acceleration actions, making commitments to accelerate existing commitments on women, peace, and security in small arms. But I'd love to hear your perspective. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, right, right there, please. And please, uh, let's try to keep questions brief so that we can have more uh, participation. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Ivo Fung. I come from the Office of Disarmament Affairs. And I wish to make a comment. Uh, before doing that, I'll, let me thank all the panelists. My comment is very uh, simple and it addresses the whole issue of the SDG. The SDGs really is about measurement. Measurement. And uh, the, uh, the distinguished uh, delegate from uh, Mexico who uh, made the very uh, uh, effective uh, keynote address pointed to the fact that when it comes to goal 16 especially, measurement there is more about quality than quantity. And he is very right because uh, the issues that we have been encountering in the collection of data, my office is a co-custodian together with uh, UNODC on tag on uh, indicator 16.4.2. The difficulty we've been facing in the collection of data, which would lend some credibility to the whole issue of measurement when it comes to all the actions that are in six, uh, goal 16, is that one, 
countries are not equipped with information or even with structures that would allow them to measure or to collect credible data on 16.4.2, the flows of illicit uh, uh, weapons. And uh, there is also the issue of uh, uh, the whole reporting of uh, data that credible data or first-hand data, authoritative data should come from government themselves. When we look at the issue of uh, illicit flows of weapons, as I said, they, the governments are not equipped. What we as co-custodians have been doing in the context of the POA, the Program of Action, we have uh, tried to open up the template for national reporting to include provisions that will allow government to report on their uh, uh, issues, on their uh, work on uh, small arms and light weapons. But even so, we have not been able to collect uh, credible data. The UNODC has, on its own, come up with a questionnaire, firearms questionnaire. All of these tools are experimental. And my uh, issue is that we hope that this review of Goal 16 would allow states to have a way out, which would be, one, either consider the secondary data generated by institutions like CIPRI, like Small Arms Survey, and others as uh, being credible. Or second, they would have to uh, strengthen uh, their capacity, and it's already provided within Go 16, and it was uh, made reference to, which is 16.A, strengthening national institutions. But we really hope that this uh, review uh, would allow states to tackle the issue of data collection appropriately when it comes to Go Great. 16. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, let's, uh, let's try to reduce the, the comments and focus on questions. We've got uh, a great panel up here. I've got one in the middle here. And, uh, and then we'll come to the panel and we'll have time for another round if, uh, if um, oh, was you? OK, I was pointing to up, up closer up front. But uh, oh. oh, well, th it's, we can get her second round. <laughs> OK. Hi, um, my we'll name is Alex soon. Hineker, and I'm with the New York City Mayor's Office for International Affairs. Um, last year, we submitted a voluntary local review of our progress towards the SDGs, and this year we're submitting um, another one focusing on the priority goals this year. So this conversation is really interesting and informative, and I wish I had been talking to you four weeks ago when I was starting to work on our SDG 16 reporting. Um, one thing I'm still struggling with, and I thought maybe you could help um, uh, provide suggestions on is where does cybersecurity fit into all of this? Because it's an open data issue, it's an access to information issue, it is an organized crime issue. So, what do you think about reporting on cybersecurity within SDG 16? Thanks. Great, thanks, Alex. Very succinct. Good. All right, we'll have time for uh, another round, but I, I got uh, sort of questions on how to link, we'll, we'll call it a question about measurement um, and a question about cybersecurity. Anyone, who wants to tackle? Yeah? Yeah, I can start very quickly, and thank you for connecting again with the gender uh, aspect, of course. Uh, everything <laughs> okay, everything correct. How to do it? Well, uh, yes, uh, we are trying. Uh, we are trying to, to start with very, very practical initiatives. Uh, let uh, the, the focal points of the different, uh, you know, communities meet. Uh, uh, you, you may have some eye openers, uh, some exercises that are very simple but are not uh, there yet. So uh, indeed, the entire issue of gender is, uh, uh, is fundamental here. Uh, there is the issue of data, the issue of data disaggregation, you know, uh, something that, that is uh, so simple as disaggregating data by sex to have uh, information that is based on male and female. Sometimes uh, it's a huge challenge for, for measurement, and uh, the push that is given by the entire framework of the SDGs is, is very important. And I wanted to respond quickly to Ivor Fung on the, on the indicators. Uh, indeed, the, the global indicator 16.4.2 is, uh, uh, is mostly 
aiming at educating countries to, to trace arms, to, to, to identify the illicit origin of, of arms. And it's, it's an important exercise that many, many countries are still unable to do. The, the numbers that this indicator will generate is not really a number that, that is going to tell you the, the extent of illicit arms flows, but it will tell you a bit more about the capacity of countries to establish the illicit origin of, of, of arms. And indeed, thank you for the push uh, for uh, unofficial data. On Monday, we had a, a side event organized by the Goal 16 Data Initiative, of which we are part with many other um, civil society organizations, trying really to to raise awareness of the existence of uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of information that is out there, that is available, that states can use to measure progress. Thank you. Thank you. Just a brief, yeah, just a brief comment about the first uh, uh, series of questions about gender, uh, it being a cross-cutting issue. We believe illicit flows are a cross-cutting issue. As I said in my opening remarks, that. Uh, 16.4.1 isn't just about addressing that one target, it's about addressing the target to create revenue to address a whole host of other targets and goals. One of the things that was mentioned is policy coherence. Uh, in, in that particular context, uh, we work uh, quite a bit on this point with governments um, uh, in the context of the Addis Tax Initiative. We, uh, we co-lead Commitment 3 under the ATI uh, framework, which is on policy coherence, creating uh, uh, a group of policies, regulations, laws that uh, governments can implement to address uh, illicit flows. One in particular is that they uh, create uh, multi-agency teams within the government uh, of uh, relevant agencies to come at the illicit flows problem from a multi-dimensional approach, uh, and we're we're seeing an uptick in, in that uh, Kenya has just implemented a multi-agency team to do just that. So again, early days, but uh, interest and progress moving in the right direction. Great, thank you. We still have cybersecurity, uh, Margin Tuesday, and you wanna tackle any of those? Somewhat unenthusiastically, but yes. <laughs> I, th <laughs> I, um, I think it is said, when you look at Cy goal 16 in relation to, I think, some of the cyber questions, you need to distinguish between cybersecurity and cybercrime. Obviously, cybercrime is the well-entrenched and cyber-enabled crime is a well-entrenched and important part of how criminal groups perpetuate their activities, how they launder their money, and so on and so forth. So there unquestionably any steps taken to address cybercrime, I would say, is part of your SDG 16 achievement framework though there is no natural home for it. Um, overall, you know, we are moving towards trying to promote the sense that you need to be crime sensitive in everything that we do in the development spectra, uh, spectrum. That often investments in upgrading of communications software and capacities, but also, frankly, even on more prosaically upgrading of basic infrastructure, so where the investment in ports um, trade routes, other things, need also to be um, s crime sensitive. And what we have seen broadly, and we're in the middle of a series now on critical infrastructure and organized crime, is that the globe's critical infrastructure is very vulnerable to cyber attack. So I would make the connections, if you want to sp focus specifically on goal 16, to the investments in communications infrastructure and how they are physically protected, the integration of um, cybersecurity into existing critical infrastructure, and then any steps taken for prevention towards cybercrime, including awareness, including um, you know, advocacy campaigns around individuals' awareness and prevention. I think that's really the way to do it because unfortunately, more and more of cybersecurity's responsibility sits in the hands of the individuals, in the hands of their devices. And there is, a, I would say, a big gap there in terms of people's awareness of how much they have to be proactive about their own cybersecurity. Great, thanks. In order to get, get some more uh, questions on the table, we'll come back to Martin in the, in the next round, and we'll bring, come up to the first half of the room. I've got uh, here in the fourth row here, who I promised in the first round, and then we've got Jeffrey and 
uh, and, and over here. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My name is Simonetta Grassi from UNODC. I would first of all like to thank the panelists. I completely agree with most of what was said. But in particular, Tuesday, I like very much your critic approach to the fact that maybe we have missed a little bit on the SDG 60.4. And this is also my question to all panelists. Um, we speak about that we need to break the silos and, and, and try to connect the SDG among them. We have to connect the, ST, the SDG in 16, but we are not really connecting not even the one single target, which is 16.4. I mean, even though I think in the interventions, and I wonder, and that's my question, is whether the reason for this not connecting the different elements that are contained in the 16.4 is not due to the fact that the attention is too much on the firearms on the one side, on the money on the other side, and we omit the, the, the connection. I mean, Tuesday mentioned that there is no indicator for organized crime, but we omit the element of the rule of law, because if we don't, um, think of closing the circle in the first place. For example, uh, yes, seizing illicit firearms, reducing illicit arms flows, but bringing the perpetrators to justice is equally important because the absence of justice creates a sense of impunity, uh, takes away trust of citizens. So we speak about resilience, building resilience. So what would the panel suggest to better connect the different elements within the 16.4? and then afterwards also with the other targets. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, here in the second row, Jeffrey Laurenti. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Laurenti with the UN Association USA, Princeton, uh, Trenton area chapter. Uh, on a day when uh, news reports say that the United States is pointing to the French and saying, how did the missiles we sold you end up in Hiftar's hands? One is struck that in this panel, say for Tom Cardamone's mention of Kenya at one point at a level of generality and not specificity. So I'm going to beg each of you in your respective fields, since most of you are in the NGO sector and can speak somewhat frankly <laughs> or candidly, in which countries, both in the developing world and the developed world, do you see some kind of model cases of action, we're now a quarter of the way through this SDG period, at actually coming to grips with and coming up with better ways of, of signaling, and uh, finding, and tracking uh, small arms flows, the financial flows, uh, and organized <coughs> crime activities. And I know Mr. Bourgeau is a UN employee, must be more careful, but you are in a cockpit in Lebanon of where, by at least uh, press accounts, there is a certain flow of this stuff. Uh, so uh, how do you, at the country level, actually monitor, see, and whom do you point fingers to uh, when you find fairly egregious action? So where do we see progress, and who are the worst non-performers? Great. Thank you. I think, and if you don't mind, we're going to take two more questions before we come back. And so here in the second row, and then. Good afternoon. I'm Wadez Rukato, and I'm with the IPI's African Junior Professionals Fellowship. My question is towards Tom, Tuesday, and Isaac. Um, so Tuesday, you get cited the example of South Africa and state capture, where the president was essentially um, central to the siphoning off of large amounts of money. Tom, you mentioned the need for governments to step up, and Isaac, you spoke about um, a strategy for driving action towards um, target 16.4. My question is around leadership, and um, any one of you, uh, if any one of you could please describe the kind of leadership that you believe is critical um, for driving action towards um, target 16.4, at what level it operates, and whether you could cite any examples of compelling leadership that has driven action towards um, the target. Thanks. Great, thank you. And uh, Omar, yeah, all the way in the, in the back there with the, yeah, with the hoop bearings. <laughs> Um, hello, uh, my name is Paola Palacios. I come from Mexico, from the Mexican, Mexican chapter of Transparency International. And my uh, question is to our colleague, um, Mrs. Retano. Um, you, you mentioned before that, uh, well, uh, civil society organizations were 
uh, being aware of the closure of civic spaces around the world because of governmental, um, well, some regimes in, in the world. So um, what would you suggest regarding SDG 16 and its um, uh, implementation and monitoring? How, us, how we as uh, people from civil society could, could uh, coordinate in a more efficient and um, and well, yeah, in a, in a more coordinated way to to face these new challenges that the world is is living. And we also would like to to invite you all to the um, to the uh, an, a side event on Friday on <laughs> Four West Street, Four Four West Forty Three Street about uh, the other uh, SDGs sixteen uh, sixteen point four five and ten, just to for you to okay, be got there. A, we got Thank a you. question and a plug there. Um, you know, I, we, I, I think we only have one more time to come back to the panel, so if I just could take one more question. There's still a lot of hands up there, and that right there, the number one <coughs> finger in the air right in front of you, Laura, yeah. And then Thank we'll you. come back to the panel for final, uh, final responses. Thank you. I'm Sergio Chaparro from the Center for Economic and Social Rights, um, and my question is for uh, all the panelists. Uh, I would like to ask you if do you agree uh, with including uh, Profit shifting and uh, undeclared uh, offshore assets as part of the definition of illicit financial flows. I and why do you agree or disagree with that? Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, okay, a lot, lot on the table. Table there. We've got. Um, uh, if we're on time, just about seven minutes. Um, Martin, I'm going to come to you first. So uh, for your final responses, you've got one direct question from. Uh, that'll get you into trouble, but uh, you know, respond as you may wish. Thank you. Actually, <clears throat> uh, before responding to that question, I just wanted to say on the, on the data that we need to encourage member states and the donors community to invest in uh, data collection because this is costly, actually, and we see at UNDP that there is not always appetite, actually, uh, from, uh, you know, the donor community to really invest in this type of uh, uh, in, in data collection. Um, just maybe uh, the question on the leadership. Um, I mean, I think uh, what at UNDP we have seen is, you know, the leadership that enables to really respond to the, the, the challenges that are set in the 16.4 and specifically on the, on the, on the armed violence. Uh, it's a leadership that brings actually uh, everybody uh, at the table, that brings especially civil society, uh, the youth, um, and the victims actually of uh, armed violence, uh, women, um, etc. At, in, a, in a conversation, uh, both at local and at, and at national level. So I think this is what uh, I would say is, is a good leadership. Uh, and the question on Lebanon, I mean, uh, well, UNDP doesn't work specifically on uh, uh, organized crime. I mean, I think it's by mandate, uh, UNODC actually, that is mandated in the United Nations to really uh, work specifically on that. So, um, I, you know, I, I can just say that overall we have a mandate more to strengthen actually the rule of law, rule of law institutions, uh, good governance. So, uh, but we don't focus, you know, specifically on, I know those are burning issues, but yeah, by mandate, you know, this is not those that we tackle, you know, specifically. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll, I mean, we'll, we'll come back to Anna and, and come down uh, this way, and then Isak wants to, to say one short word at, at, the, at the end. So Anna, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to quickly respond to, to Simonetta. And, and to Tuesday in part because uh, she, she was the first one to, to, to say that about connecting the elements of the target 16.4. Yes, it, it is an important exercise, but it's not the only one because I think y y there, there are so many important aspects that are uh, not necessarily uh, connected to the need to define what is organized crime. It's, it's something, it's, it's an exercise that may lead to some uh, perverse uh, results because you may end up the, uh, mixing apples and oranges. So I don't want to say that it's not an important thing to do to connect financial flows, arms flows, and organized crime, but it is one of the, of the potential uh, ways to, to, to deal with this. 
And, uh, and about uh, the best performance and the worst performance, indeed, uh, what, what we do, one of the things that we do at this Moram survey uh, is to, to measure the transparency of uh, uh, arms exports, uh, or small arms exports, we deal with small arms. And uh, uh, never forget that arms uh, start uh, as licit, you know, so they are not something forbidden, uh, you know, in m many contexts. So uh, arms export is a legal thing, but it may be carried out in a more or less transparent way, and this is what we do every year. We score countries, uh, and we indicate uh, who are the best performance and the worst performance. I can tell you that there is no country in the world who ranks at the top of the score that is available. There are 25 points and no country gets 25 points. So there is margin for improvement in arms experts. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree with that. There's margin for improvement among all countries, although there are bright lights. Uh, there are a couple of questions about which countries are doing a good job, where's leadership look good, or political will is the way we usually frame it. Um, there's no country that's perfect across the board, but there are countries who are, who are doing important, good things. I mentioned Kenya earlier. That's uh, the whole multi-agency uh, team to address illicit flows. That's being led by the Revenue Department. Um, uh, just yesterday, the uh, Mexican uh, finance minister resigned in protest due to the levels of corruption within the government and the seeming impunity in that country that allows for that to continue. I, that was a tremendous amount of uh, uh, sort of political will in the sense of making it known that this continues to be a massive problem within Mexico. Uh, is the government using our GF trade tool in the Customs Department now? Uh, I know that this was approved at the very highest levels of the government by the president. Uh, so, you, so you get these bright lights. I've been in countries where there is no political will at the top, but there are in tremendously dedicated people in the mid-levels of the bureaucracy that are fighting as much as they possibly can given their portfolio and the context of which, the political context in which they're operating to try to get change within their government. So I think what civil society needs to do is to find these good actors uh, and give them every support possible, information, data, pats on the back uh, publicly uh, when they do good, positive things and maybe a little bit of uh, uh, competition between neighboring countries. Country A is doing something really well. You say to country B, well, look what they're doing. That's, that's working. Uh, you can really hopefully begin to create an atmosphere where positive change can take place over time. Great, thank you. Tuesday, please. Thank you so much for the superb questions. Um, so, I think on, to answer the UNODC question, why did we miss an SDG target on organized crime? Maybe we turn that back to UNODC and ask them why we missed a target on organized crime. I think there were definitional questions. I think there are challenges. We are building an index to answer the question to the UN Association to measure organized crime, and we needed 64 indicators. So it's a complex topic, and it is one where there, it, of course, has multiple component parts, human trafficking, drugs trafficking, et cetera, et cetera, as well as the actors. So it isn't the easiest thing to measure in a straightforward way. But leaving it, in a tar leaving it within a target without an indicator means that it will not be measured. So we have lo lost an opportunity there. Um, noting the point on the rule of law, of course, justice systems would be picked up in target 16.3. Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, I think a, l a lot of these questions that you asked together come to what is the role of political leadership, um, what is the role of mid-level officials, what is the role of civil society in the fight against organized crime, and who's doing their job well. And of course, those are difficult questions to answer in generalities, they're easier to questions to answer in specificities, but again, it comes back to the question of organized crime encompasses many things. And what we, and it's unquestionably political. So I think one answer is firstly, there tends to be a reflexivity to try and answer what is essentially a, often a political problem with technical solutions, which we know doesn't work. So technical assistance to reinforce 
state officials, give them anti-corruption training, give them sensitization. If there is a system of overall impunity, kleptocracy, um, large illicit markets, large uh, informal economies where there's a, a, a lack of capacity to regulate or understand either transactions or the marketplace itself, those technocratic solutions are ineffective. So it is a question, I think, around politics. Now, we see at the highest levels of the state in a number of countries the instrumentalization of the fight against organized crime for political objectives. Um, who one decides, who a government or a politician decides to describe as organized crime is often a political decision, which is a challenge in and of itself. And we know that the fight against organized crime is often used as an excuse for emergency measures. It's an excuse, used as an excuse for increasing militarization or securitization of particular conversations. It's used as an excuse to generate more resources or attention, often with very detrimental impacts. And broadly, we, uh, there's an oversimplification often, again. And so we, you know, the war on crime as much as the war on terror is probably a discussion set up to, to be lost. So I think in some ways, while the correct answer to, you know, every good response to organized crime requires a committed <coughs> champion. At the same time, let's be wary of committed champions because some of those haven't turned out so well. Um, which then comes, I think, back to Tom's point around middle, middle level officials and often, you know, governments, even when the top is corrupt and the bottom is transactionally run by corruption, uh, there are often very sterling offers and I would reinforce the fact that we need to identify, protect, support, enable, and connect positive agents for change where we see them. And the same in civil society. So civil society works incredibly hard and often in incredible danger. We run, uh, have just begun to the beginning of this year, a civil society resilience fund against organized crime, which at the moment is Norwegian funded to support individual activists and individual journalists who are working at risk to themselves to catalyze their efforts and make connections. So I think for you know, Transparency International, for the Global Initiative, for GFI, for Small Arms Survey, for all of the NGO, international NGO coalitions, we can help build those coalitions and we should. So there isn't a simple answer, but ideally we would see that effort and momentum towards positive states at all levels. And I think greater transparency at all levels would help us a long way in understanding who's really pulling the strings behind the scenes. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And uh, Isaac, did you want to take one yeah, real quick? Yeah. Just yeah. a brief, um, regarding the question on, on, on leadership, I just want to, to share a national experience. Uh, recently we uh, launched a national council for the 2030 Agenda, uh, chaired by, by the president, by the office of the president, uh, in, a, in a manner like, a, like, like a leading by the example, this, um, this council now um, have some local chapters at the municipalities at the state level, and also within the legislature and um, some uh, civil society representatives uh, and business sector representatives are, are on the same table. So uh, this, is, this is very inspiring experience, if I may say, in order to implement, in order to accomplish the, the, the 2030 agenda. Because uh, the, we, 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 first of all, we try to align uh, within this council uh, all national policies, uh, uh, laws, and programs to the 2030 agenda. But also within this council, uh, all the authorities, the national authorities, have to, to deliver what, what they have been doing regarding uh, the different um, uh, responsibilities on the different uh, 2030 agenda. So this is, uh, I mean, a very, very concrete experience of, of leadership. I mean, coming from the office of the president with the whole um, uh, federal government and then the municipalities, the, the state level and the legislature, we, we believe it's the way forward uh, to, to, to implement, to better implement uh, the 23rd Agenda in general, not only 16th, uh, uh, the, the SDG 16th, thank you. 
Great, thank you so much. I really uh, appreciate that ending on a positive note. Uh, we're, we're out of time, so I'll just leave it at that. I joked at the beginning uh, that this is really goal 17 in action, and I think the partnerships that we've uh, had uh, uh, here really um, exemplify that and uh, really want to congratulate the, the Global Initiative. It's, it's, it's great to see the growth uh, over the years, and, uh, and I look forward to um, partnering more in the future. So thank you all very much for coming.